Um, so again, um, when we think of when we think of uh, countries, sometimes we think of um, they have they have also almost an identity to them. Uh, they 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 at some point they come to stand for something in our in our lives. And I guess uh, just by way of example, I would I would say, and I, I'm a little I'm a little careful to do that because what the idea of what that may be it may be changing but uh, uh, at least uh, for much of my life uh, if you thought of America what do you think that people would associate that with America freedom yeah freedom um, freedom uh, is, is is an idea that you would associate with America um, it's, it's kind of, uh, I think, and I don't think that's just in America, I think that that's a, a concept that people would associate America with um, uh, in other places as well. And, uh, and the, reason, the, reason I'm, uh, the reason I bring that up is because uh, we are now coming to a, a, a turning point in the story but this story has been building for a long time. Um, it, it began when uh, God allowed Joseph's brother to take and throw him in a pit. And then uh, he convicted them to, rather than to kill them, to give them to slave traders who then took Joseph to Egypt. And, um, and then uh, uh, through a series of events that we don't need to recount, um, uh, Joseph rose to be Pharaoh's second in command, and then a famine brought uh, Joseph's brothers uh, to Egypt, where they were reunited, and um, and and uh, they were allowed to sell uh, settle in Goshen, and they prospered, and that was really good for them because um, uh, not only did they multiply and become very numerous, but they also because they settled in Goshen because they were shepherds and uh, shepherding was detestable to the Egyptians, they were left to their own devices, and so they didn't really um, uh, mix much with the people around them, and they developed their own identity because of that. Uh, then things turned, and God allowed them to be enslaved, and so the question is, well, why? Why did God, uh, why did God allow, uh, allow that? Why did they... God bring them to this place only to be enslaved, something that God knew was going to happen. And that's just another way of asking, well, what is Egypt to you? Um, in Exodus 6, we, we, we looked at um, seven I wills, and uh, we're about to, we're about to uh, come to the first I will, uh, and uh, it's what it's a prelude to that, I will. Um, in second, uh, Exodus 6, it says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. And I will, and I will represent to you that those two I wills are different. They seem very similar, but they're different. And we're looking at the first of those, the I will bring you out, and exactly what that is and what God is trying to uh, tell Teach the uh, teach the people of Israel from this experience, and he. So this is the point at which we've come. So in Exodus seven verse four it says, "When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my house." Uh, and so the land of Egypt uh, is the place that he is bringing the people of Israel out of, and. Um, and he says, when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. So he is now about to set the stage for bringing his people out. So what is, what is this Egypt? Um, and he, God makes it very clear. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is after they've, they've been delivered from Egypt. Um, and what he says is, out of the house of slavery. So the Egypt, Egypt had become 
in the minds of the Israelis the place where they had been enslaved. Um, and uh, it's interesting, does anybody want to take a guess at what the, the two references where he, he refers to the land of Egypt as the house of slavery, what this preference, it was it, exact same thing both times. And the answer is, <laughs> I know it's, it would be, uh, if you do the answer, you would be uh, a, 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 a uh, Bible savant indeed, but in both cases, this was to introduce the, the Ten Commandments. So this was the first time that the, the preference to giving the people the Ten Commandments, the law, was this statement that I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And so, um, so, but then let's take it a step. What is this land of slavery and why, what, is the, how, what does that mean to us? So back in John 8, verse 31, um, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed that if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. But why they would say that, I have no idea. They have obviously forgotten their history. But anyway, they go on to say, how is that you say you will become free? And Jesus explains it this way. Jesus answered them, truly, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So really, although it is about physical enslavement, there is a deeper connotation to there, and that is the enslaving power of sin. And the fact that when it's in our lives and it is unchecked and God is not on his throne, that that, that power of sin enslaves us. And, and there's another reason that, that, that there's such a close association between the slavery and sin, and it is because the other thing I think we associate Egypt with, and that is we associate Egypt with, um, we associate Egypt with idols, right? Egypt was the land of idols. It was a land of idol worship. Um, and so uh, when you, but, but when we think of, um, when we think of idols, we say to ourselves, well, we don't worship idols anymore. That's something that's in the past. We don't do that anymore, but that, that's not true. Um, Colossians 3 says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. An idol is anything in your life that you set above God. Anything that you want more than God, anything that you want more than to be with God, anything that separates you from God, anything that causes us to sin, that is an idol, okay? And so, um, so this story, yes, it's a story of freedom from physical bondage and slavery, but really it is, it is, the, it is the, uh, a tale of God's uh, delivering his people from the power of sin and the power of idols in their lives uh, and where he wants them to be. Um, so in Exodus 7-8, now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to read the passage to start, and the reason is we are covering a lot of territory today. And we, we have to land the airplane. And so what's going to happen is, uh, Lorraine, I'm going to give you permission when the time comes just to tell me because we may well not get to the end of the lesson because that's how much territory we get up. And I, do, I don't generally like to, to cover this many passages all at the same time, but the problem is... Um, they really go together. This really is one of those places where um, to truly appreciate everything that God's doing, you have to see it uh, all together, although each, each passage is in itself interesting. Um, and what I, what, I will, what I will tell you is that what it teaches um, is these passages teach about the power of sin. And it is a, a, a 
particularly uh, what I would refer to as unrepentant sin. And there are sins that we commit, which are sins that we commit in ignorance or sins that we commit um, in a moment of weakness or by accident. We're, all, we're not all perfect. We do that all the time. Those are things that we do. But what I'm talking about is the kind of sin that um, is an idol in your mind, that it is, um, that it is something that you commit again and again and again. And sad, truth be told, it's sad, um, but this can happen even in a believer's life where they, they set up an idol uh, or an idol comes into their life and so dominates their life uh, that it takes control of it and then they're, slaves, they're a slave to it. Um, but this is the, the real power uh, of this, uh, this kind of sin is, is um, a person who's never yielded themselves to the Lord. And so what we're looking at that, and this, this, these, this sin can take all different types of forms. Um, this sin can be anger, unchecked anger, like we just cannot release our anger and it comes to dominate our lives. This sin can be, uh, this sin can be uh, unforgiveness. This sin can be, um, it can be addiction to drugs. Or alcohol, or um, or or, uh, or food. This uh, this uh, can be um, this can be sexual sin. This this sin can take a variety of different faces. But the one thing about it is when it when it takes hold of people's lives, you can really see the power of sin and how it enslaves people when it takes hold of people's lives. And what we're going to see in the passages that follow is a lesson about what this, this unchecked, unrepentant sin looks like um, and uh, God's reaction to it. But the place that we begin is in Exodus 7, verse 8. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and then they did just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became serpent. I think one of the things, uh, just to me, that's interesting about the Bible is sometimes because of translations, you don't always get a flavor for the words. And here we kind of, when we hear serpent, we hear just snake. But in the Bible, the word serpent here is not just a snake, it's, it, it's a great snake. And sometimes can be translated, this word can be translated as dragon or sea monster. So we're talking about a huge snake. We're talking about one of those, you know, those big anaconda, big giant snake things. So the snakes that come out um, uh, are these huge snakes. And of course, uh, the Lord has already primed Moses that his, his, uh, this staff, which is his, this symbol of his power, the shepherd's staff, is what he's going to turn uh, into a snake. But the point is here is that, um, is, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, <laughs> Then Pharaoh also called for his wise men and the sorcerers, and, and they, they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. And that is, um, Pharaoh's magicians, for whatever reason, were able to do the exact same thing. And the point is that idols have power, and you should not, <laughs> uh, and, and it would be foolish not to see that, because if you set something up as an idol in your life, or if you bow down to something as an idol in your life, it will have a power over you. It is a false god. Uh, let's, let's not be confused. It, ha it, it is, uh, but nevertheless, uh, that idol has power. Sin has power. And if we submit ourselves to that power, it will have the power to uh, enslave us. Um, and then it goes on to say, uh, but then it says Aaron's staff swallowed up their straps, 
right? And so the point is, is don't, don't make it any mistake of it. Um, while idols have power and sin has power, God's power is greater, right? And God, God can, can, can uh, overcome uh, the power of these false idols. He can overcome the power of sin. But nevertheless, we see Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And you ask, how can this be? He's seen this demonstration. They think, okay, well, I'm going to throw, this becomes a snake. But then he sees his magicians can do the same thing. And, uh, and the, the snake from, um, from the staff that uh, 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 devours the magician's uh, staffs, and yet the same, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And, and, and I think the reason is, it's because in his own mind, he's thinking, okay, well, I can do similar kind of things. I've got similar power. Uh, so I may have lost this battle, but I'm not necessarily going to lose uh, the war. So part of this is about the power of sin in all of our lives and the power of sin in everybody's lives, but it is also about Pharaoh's sin in particular. And his sin, uh, which is the root of every sin, um, sin is anything that is contrary to the will of God. That's, that's a real simple definition of sin. Anything that is contrary to the will of God is sin. And so... Um, <laughs> He did not want to yield himself to the will of God. And what was the will of God? That the people of Israel would be let go. Uh, and he was not willing to do it. In his own mind, he was his own God. And he would not yield to God's authority. Um, and as we'll see, um, and that really is at the heart of every person. Every person um, who is... Uh, is unwilling to yield themselves to God. If you ask, if you got to the root of why they don't want to yield themselves to God, it is because they want to be the God in their own lives. They write, they want to be the person who makes the rules and who decides what is right and wrong and decides what they can and cannot do. Um, and so they set themselves up these, but these, uh, uh, so they set themselves up in this way. Uh, but as we see, uh, God's authority devours the authority of men. And that only becomes more and more evident as we see uh, the passages that follow. Um, so the Lord said to Moses, Okay, go to, the, go to the Pharaoh and meet him on the bank of the Nile, and take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. Right? And then he tells him what he's going to say to him. Um, and, he's, and his message is, you're going to strike the rod with the staff, and it will be turned to, to blood. And what's going to happen? The fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will become foul, and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking from the Nile. The first sign is the plague of blood. Uh, and so the first sign of unrepentant sin that you will, that you will see that, that should be a clue that there is some idle or unchecked sin in your life is uh, a sin that just pollutes the atmosphere. It's, it's something that takes um, wholesomeness in your life and it just um, it brings with it a, a odor of decay uh, and death. It just takes uh, what is good and pure and in life and sullies it. Um, and uh, it's like uh, you can, um, uh, it is just, uh, it is tangible. It is, it is something real. It is when you have unchecked sin in life, it just alters things and it does it in a very subtle, su subtle way. But that's what the first sign is that there's just not something right. There is something. Something is, is rotten in the state of Denmark, as they say, um, and, and you, can, you can tell it. That is the first sign. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over the streams, over their pools, over the reservoirs, and they may become blood, and there will be blood throughout the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. 
because this is a stone uh, of sin that's never repented, it subtly goes everywhere. It literally follows you everywhere in your life and pollutes everything in your life. It is inescapable. And you may do, as people do, you may do something that you try to isolate it, that you try to compartmentalize it, that you try to put it in a single place, but it follows you everywhere. Uh, so Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded. So they did what God wanted them to do. And sure enough, all the water was turned, turned into blood. The fish in the Nile uh, <laughs> became foul. And the Egyptians could not drink from the Nile. And blood was through all the land of Egypt. So God's, the first plague God sends, uh, he does as he, as he said he would do. And it goes everywhere and was in everything. Uh, listen, but notice you will. It will be interesting uh, as we go forward, and you'll see a um, progression of people's different reactions. And I actually did before I put together a little chart that kind of shows you the what the plagues are and how people reacted to them. And the and the, the first re the first reaction to this this plague of blood is the magicians did the same thing. It's like, hey, we've got, we've got our own resources, so we'll do the same thing. And, and you can see that Pharaoh's reaction is, once again, his, his heart was hardened, and he just simply did not listen to them. And in fact, he turned away and was not concerned. Uh, and that's kind of our reaction. Even, even if this sin, that we, are, we, we become aware of it, um, that it's in our lives, it doesn't concern us because we believe we can control it. We can keep it out of our homes. It won't affect our families. It won't affect our jobs. This is the lie that we tell ourselves. And so um, Pharaoh goes into his house and he's just not concerned. It can't come in if I don't bring it. That's his attitude. Um, meanwhile, the Egyptians are digging around in the Nile just so they can have clean water to drink. Well, seven days passes, and God, in his mercy, sends another sign. So what is the next sign? He says, uh, go to Pharaoh and say to him, uh, if you refuse to let my people go, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. And I don't know if you can see them. There's a, a movie called Exodus, uh, God and Kings, it's not at all biblically um, uh, accurate, so don't take that as an endorsement of that, but it does create a lot of images. These are frogs that are leaping up out of the Nile. And what he says, the Nile will swarm with frogs, and they will come up and go into your house, into your bedroom, and your bed, and the house of your servants, and your people, and into your ovens, and in your kneading bowls, and Yes. So guess what? Your sin just got less. <laughs> and, um, and so what does it do? Uh, it says, so he says, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, streams, and pools. Uh, and frogs, sure enough, frogs are going to come up. And, and, and uh, so he did. And sure enough, frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Uh, this is just a, for those of you who look at it aside, you'll see he starts by using the staff. At some point it's going to change and uh, what, what the Lord's instructions are not to use, your, use the staff, but if you catch it and I don't catch it, uh, point it out to me so I can, so I can point out to you what, that, that it's changed and why. Um, so this is, uh, this is the frogs. Well, uh, the magicians did the same uh, with their secret arts, and the question is, why? Why would you want to do this to yourself? Um, but uh, Pharaoh uh, called for Moses because he realizes uh, that he's got a problem. And uh, the lie that we live is that we, we believe we're still in control. We think we can isolate our problems. Um, and some of us may cry out like Pharaoh, Pharaoh did. He cries out, he wants relief, so he, he asked that Moses uh, remove the frogs. Um, and um, 
And really, uh, really at this point in his life, this, this sin has become so obvious and so ugly. Uh, it's invaded a part of our lives that's very personal. And so we want it out. But really, we, we, it's not because we want the sin out of the life. It's not because we're ready to, to take down that idol or yield ourselves to God. It's because we just don't want to live with the consequences of the sin that we're suffering through. Um, and this is a really gross image, isn't it? So you, this is uh, the, the bedroom of Pharaoh, and these are frogs that have leapt up onto his bed where his wife awakened to find them. Um, but we think, nonetheless, even when, when this kind of sin becomes obvious to us, it, it rears its ugly head in some part of our lives and makes it, it, makes it uncomfortable makes it ugly and foul that we can still control it but we can still isolate it to where it just happens to, to spill out and if that's what you believe and if that's how you think you can, you can deal with things God in his mercy will send another sign um, so Mo Moses says to Pharaoh tell me when shall I entreat for you? And uh, Moses says, uh, and, and then Pharaoh says, oh, tomorrow. And so Moses says, may you, so that, so that you may know that there is no one like our Lord, we're gonna let it, we're gonna make it happen just as you, uh, just as you request. And so Moses cries out to the Lord and the fire, frogs died out and they piled them up in heaps and the land becomes foul. But of course, um, God is merciful. He does as Pharaoh, he responds to Pharaoh's cry. But as we see, um, his uh, request, his entreaty was not born of repentance. He just wants to escape the consequences. So as soon as he gets the relief that he wants uh, from, from, from the ugliness that has popped up in his life, uh, he will not yield him, himself to God, and he will not let the people go as God has asked. Um, so God, in his mercy, sends another sign. Um, then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats. And sure enough, they do so. And uh, the gnats... Uh, there's gnats everywhere on Man and Beast, and if you're wondering what this little guy here is, uh, is a gnat, and um, he looks a lot like a mosquito, and of course, if you've ever been where gnats are, you knew what they do, is they bite you. They're just these little bites, and there's these little pinpricks of irritation, and, 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 and that's what a gnat does to and that's kind of like the next sign is your life, is that you think when it shows, it rears its ugly head, and it goes, that ugliness has gone away, uh, that you may be done with it, but all, then you become aware that it is, your life becomes with, filled with constant irritation, and then it becomes filled with constant little disappointments and little irritations that just kind of, that kind of bite at you. And um, the small failures and small disappointments that remind you that you really, uh, you are really not living right, that you are not in control, even if you think you are. Um, and so uh, at this point, uh, the magicians try right uh, but they can't do it they can't they can't make they can't bring forth gnats and so the magicians say to pharaoh this is the finger of god uh at this point the magicians uh realize um as many of us do when we come to this point where the sin in our lives the unchecked sin in our lives uh is constantly irritating us and constantly disappointing us and really we're irritated by ourselves and our circumstances and we're disappointed by ourselves and what we've brought into our lives. Um, and um, 
and we realize that we can't control it, right? It has control over us. All we can really do is compartmentalize it, try to, to minimize the irritation, to try and salve it as best we can, and to, uh, and to, and to just live with the, the, the irritations and the disappointments and the consequences. Um, and, but we have a choice, as everybody has a choice when they come to realize that they are not in control anymore. Um, you can see the finger of God in your life. You can see that you're dealing with something that you cannot control. And you can go to the one who has greater power, or you cannot. Uh, well, as we see, Pharaoh will not repent. He hardens his heart, and he does not listen. And sometimes many people don't because they want to live, they don't want to yield themselves to something else. And even when they're not in the control, they don't want to admit that they are not in control of their lives. Um, and if that happens to you, God in his mercy will send another sign. Now the Lord says to Moses, rise early, present yourself before him as he comes out to the water and say to him, if you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and your houses. Um, and the houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Um, to me, the plague of flies represents um, when, uh, when you are living a full-blown unhealthy life. And um, those tiny pinpricks have now attracted more problems that are not just irritating and disappointment. They are introducing sickness and unhealthiness into your life. Um, and you can't master it. It is your master. It's everything. And it's everywhere and everything. And it's swarming around you. Um, and at this point in the in the the lessons about uh, in, in the lesson of Egypt, we see a true break from the rest of the world. We see that God says, "I will set apart Goshen." And Goshen, of course, is the land that the people settled to in Egypt, uh, that which was the land where my people are living, um, and that's why He referred to it that way because that was where the people of Israel settled after they came from. Uh, Israel to Egypt and he says and he but he does this and see how why he says that you may know that I am the Lord am in the midst of the land so God is doing this and he's setting apart Goshen so that the so that uh, the um, so that uh, the Pharaoh Pharaoh and the Egyptians will know that it makes a difference on what, what you believe and whether or not you yield yourself to God uh, so Goshen is set as a land apart. It's the place where God is. And the truth is that that is the one thing that I can guarantee you that every believer has. Even if at some point you get something that has got some sin in your life that is so strong that you cannot shake it, there is always a land of Goshen for you. Because there is always a time and a place where you can go to God and you can find respite and you can find peace, find peace, and it will be there for as long as you are willing to meet him there. Um, uh, and then the Lord, uh, it says the Lord, uh, so the Lord sends the plague as he uh, said he would, and the land was laid waste because of the flies. Um, so what we see again, Pharaoh calls uh, for Mer Moses and Aaron, and he says, and so he says, well, why don't you go to sacrifice within the land? Uh, Pharaoh, again, he just wants respite. Um, he's not willing to yield to God, so he does uh, what uh, people who are not <laughs> willing, uh, willing to yield to God do uh, when they realize they're not in control. They, he wants to bargain with God. So his thing is, okay, I'm not willing to let the people go. But hey, I'll let you go sacrifice within the land. Okay, is that is that a good bargain uh, for you? Uh, uh, so uh, Moses says, no, it's not right to do so. Uh, if we sacrifice 
what is an abomination to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? He says, no, we must go a three days journey as he commands us. In other words, no, no, we're not going to do what you want to do. We're going to do what God wants us to do. Uh, he's the one that's in control. Uh, so the answer is no. <laughs> um, uh, so he, Pharaoh says, I will let you go, only you should not uh, go very far away. Uh, and of course, uh, Moses has already told him this is no, but he asks again, uh, 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 well, what he does, what he essentially does is he says, I will let you go, only for, go, don't go far away. When that way, uh, when that doesn't work, so what he does is he makes a false promise, and we'll do this too. Uh, when, we, when we realize we're not in control, uh, when we when when bargaining doesn't work, we'll make promises we don't intend to keep. Lord, if you just take this away from me, I'm going to do X. I'm going to do Y. And of course, uh, again, because there's no real repentance there, it's just a desire to be relieved of the consequences. Um, it's it's not effective. But as you see, um, Moses does give uh, God does give relief through Moses. So Moses uh, does say he'll go make uh, supplication to the Lord that the uh, storms of fly, flies may depart. And he's going to do it tomorrow. So you don't have to wait. Um, but he realizes what go what's going on. He says, uh, only do not let Pharaoh deal, deal, uh, deal deceitfully again and not letting the people go to the sacrifice to the Lord. Moses, of course, already in his spirit realizes what's going on, that, that Pharaoh doesn't intend to keep his promise, but God is faithful. So Moses goes out and makes supplication to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses has asked. He's willing to do uh, what he has asked, um, so he removes the swarm of flies. And as we see, once again, Pharaoh hardens his heart um, once again. Um, so uh, Moses does his for, uh, part, but yet Pharaoh still does not yield. Again, he uh, never meant to. And again, if we do this and we go right back to what we were doing after we're relieved of some consequence um, for a period of time, uh, we will go right back to sinning again. Um, and when that happens, God in his mercy will send another sign. Um, and then the Lord says to Moses, go to Pharaoh and speak to him. Uh, if you refuse to let them go, the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence of your livestock, which are in the field. Now, keep in mind, so later if you're wondering why there's still living animals around, it's because it, it, this one only applies to those in the field, but it's going to affect all your livestock, your horses, your donkeys, your camels, your herds, your flocks, which means your sheep and your goats. Um, so for the me, the plague on the livestock uh, represents some major part of our lives. And in livestock in particular represents work, our jobs. Uh, when we're in a downward spiral due to sin, um, uh, it may not be limited to work. It may manifest in some other part of our lives. It may uh, result in the loss of a relationship or a strained and struggling relationship at home. It may re result in the loss of a good friend. But the point is, uh, we try to keep it, uh, things together, but one area of our lives, because of the unchecked sin in our lives, spirals out of control. And at this point, we're not having just a live with the irritation of our sin, the disappointment of our sin, the unhealthy life we have built for ourselves. Instead, we now suffer a significant loss, a loss that is so um, profound that we just cannot put it back together or repair it. Um, I'm not saying that if this happens to you as a believer, that you will uh, avoid this kind of loss if you find yourself in a sin and yield yourself to an idol that you would just not let down. Uh, but if you persist in unwritten pent, uh, the one thing that God gives you as a believer 
is if at some point in your life you turn and set down that idol and yield that part of your life to God, that what he does is he will redeem that. Whatever that you've gone through, he will redeem and he will make a ministry, a blessed ministry, out of that failure in your life. Um, and uh, he will be bring uh, blessings out of the wreckage and ruin of what you've done to yourself. Um, so that uh, that is what God does for a believer. Um, so what happens, of course, um, the livestock died, right? So the Lord did what he said he did. All the livestock died. Um, and of course, none of the livestock were the sons of Israel, right? Because they were all already yielded to God. Um, they did not die. They did not have this problem in their life. Um, so if you or someone you know is suffering from this kind of power of unchecked sin in your life, um, hopefully that when this, um, when, the, when this kind of loss comes into your life, it will shake you up that you're willing to do something about it and you're willing to change your life, right? Um, but uh, as we see, Pharaoh, um, so what Pharaoh does is he sends, and, and he sent, what, he, what is implied is he sends people to Goshen to see what's happening to the Israels, uh, Israelis. And behold, not even one of their livestock were dead. Uh, but still he hardened. Um, he, he, his heart was hardened. Um, so at this point, Pharaoh could see the difference between what he was experiencing and what the people of God were experience, experiencing. And at this point, we may be able to tell that we have a problem too. Uh, but like Pharaoh, we may still not yield. I mean, people do it all the time. They've got, their lives are in out of control. They're suffering significant losses in their life, profound losses, and yet they still will not yield that idol. They still will not give it up. So God, in his mercy, will send yet another sign. Um... Then the Lord said to Moses, Take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln, and let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. Um, and so that's what he does. And it will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. Um, it's a little unnerving. And so they took the soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. Moses threw, threw it toward the sky just as he had began it, and it became boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. The plague of boils uh, is the point at which uh, the consequences of unchecked sin in your life are so obvious that everybody can see it. Everybody can see it. Uh, it's on you like a festering boil. And everybody can see that you've got a problem, and everybody <laughs> will say, if they don't say it straight to your face, uh, they, may, they may try to intervene, but if they don't, they will certainly say it by, behind your back that that person has a problem. Um, and that certainly is a breaking point for many, because as long as people believe that they can conceal their problems, uh, they will try to hide their problems. And um, rather than confront them, but when there's no heart hiding it, oftentimes that's when people start looking for solutions. Uh, so the magicians could not stand, right? They could not stand, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. Uh, so uh, what happened to Pharaoh? No, not Pharaoh. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And you might think to yourself, well, that's not fair. At this point, it becomes clear that this is not, in, in the other places, it was always, who's doing the hardening? Is it Pharaoh or the Lord? And it was, in some places, quite clear, it was Pharaoh who was hardening his own heart, and Pharaoh was making the choice. Here it says, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
And you may say, well, that's not fair. Why did he do that? And I would remind you of all the times before this that Pharaoh willingly hardened his heart, um, that he brought himself to this point. But if you don't think that that's fair, consider this. In Exodus 9, 13, the Lord said to Moses, rise up early and stand before and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, let my people go so that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you, your servants, and your people, that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. And here's the point. God does what he does so that everyone will know this story. He did what he did because he wanted everybody to know this story he wanted everybody to know about the deliverance that is about to come and why it was significant and what it meant. But most of all, he wanted to make everyone to know that there was no one like God and there never will be. But then it goes on. For if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. Uh, don't miss what God is saying here. Uh, if I struck you with pestilence, which is what boils are, like the livestock, you could have you could have just died. You could be dead by now. And in fact, I've let you live, uh, but still you will not yield. And it's heartbreaking when this happens. Um, uh, sometimes people get in so deep, the uh, sin is has such power in their lives they cannot give it up, uh, even though they know, even though in every they and everyone around them knows that they've got a problem. Um, and but the point is, at any point, I could have uh, because you will not yield. I could have, uh, could have killed you. I, you, you could have died by now, uh, and, and, but I haven't done so. Um, but if you're in the point where you've got a problem, and everybody can see that you're a problem, and you still will not yield, you cannot do what it takes to submit yourself to God for whatever reason, God in his mercy will send another sign. He said, Behold, about this time I will send a very... Okay, step out. We may have to have a continuation because we have to get to the end of this. And I'm just saying, if I were Pharaoh, I, I would have done something different. But go ahead. <laughs> okay, so we will. Um, there's too much. Uh, okay, we'll just get to where we get. So he says, I will send a very heavy hail. Uh, so, <laughs> so. <laughs> So he says, he warns them, bring your livestock in from the field for safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field that is not brought home will die. <laughs> so that's what's going to happen. And, um, and the Lord says to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky. This is, where it, <laughs> this is where it changes. He's been saying, use your staff, right? Now he says, stretch out your hand. Don't bother with the staff. That the hail might fall on all of Egypt, on man and beast, and on every plant. But apparently Moses didn't catch that God had given him a different direction because Moses stretched out not his hand, but the staff toward the sky. Uh, he's now saying, that's you, you don't need that prop anymore. Uh, <laughs> so there was a hail, fire flashing continually in the midst of hail, very severe, such as not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck man and beast, every plant in the field. It shattered every tree of the field. So again, only in Goshen where the sons uh, of Israel were was there no hail. The plague of hail was the worst storm in Egypt's history. Uh, and this may be the point at which in life you suffer a devastating cons uh, consequence, not just a loss of some kind, can't repair and you can't get back, but it's something that flattens your life. It is the loss of a career. It is the loss of a marriage. It is the loss of a loved one. It is a permanent loss of health or limb. Um, 
and uh, and it is it is a horrible cost that sin exact exacts on your life if you let it go unchecked. So Pharaoh uh, sends for Moses and says, "I have sinned. The Lord is the righteous one. My people are the wicked ones. Make supplication. I will let you go." At this point, Pharaoh recognizes he has sinned. He realizes he's the problem in his own life, and he wants relief. Uh, so God gives him relief. Moses says, "As soon as I go out of the city, I will, uh, I will spread out my hands to the Lord." Moses says to Pharaoh, as soon as I go out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord, and there will no longer be hail, earth, be no longer, the, and the hail will be, there will be hail no longer, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. And sure enough, uh, he says, uh, but he recognizes, uh, but as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. Uh, so he realizes the problem. Uh, God is not fooled. He knows what is in Pharaoh's heart. Uh, he may recognize that he has sinned, but he's still not willing to yield himself to God. Uh, you know that even here, um, the devastation is uh, not complete. Um, even in this... Uh, Play, God spares the wheat and the spelt. The flax and the barley, it says, are ruined, but the wheat and the spelt were not ruined. Um, and, uh, and so the people can eat. And, and if you don't recognize that as part of God's mercy, you should. So even in this time, He continues to allow uh, Egypt to persist. Uh, but we see, sure enough, Pharaoh, uh, <laughs> Pharaoh sees that the rain and the hail and the thunder have ceased, and he sins again and hardens his heart. So he, uh, once again, he will not repent. He will not change his life. He, again, he just wants to change his consequences. We have a plan now. And so... Uh, so we will go to the next one uh, the next time. There's, uh, I know this is, is, is hard and um, to listen to, and uh, we've got only two, we've got three more plays. Uh, and, then, um, and then before we get to what the point that God is bringing us to. Um, dear Lord, uh, I pray that there's nobody uh, in here who is suffering this kind of downward spiral in their lives or that they don't know somebody uh, who is suffering this kind of downward spiral in their lives. Uh, but Lord, I, I know that there probably is. But Lord, there's hope in you. Uh, at any point, at any time, we can tear down those idols. We can submit ourselves to your will. You will give us the power and the strength and the path we need to uh, deliver us out of the uh, hell on earth we've made for ourselves. Lord, uh, if anybody is suffering 